Welcome and Happy New Year. I am calling to order this meeting of the Arlington Select Board on Monday, January 9th, 2023. I'm Select Board Chair Leonard Diggins and I will now confirm that all members in person anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Pam Hahn. Here. Sean Hurd. Yes. Steve Corsi. Yes. Eric Helmuth. Yes. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Sandy Puller. Here. Doug Heim. Here. Ashley Meyer. Here. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted in a hybrid format consistent with Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022 signed the law on July 17th, 2022, which further extends certain COVID-19 measures regarding remote participation until March 31st, 2023. Before we begin, please note the following. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom. It is being recorded and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Second, persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that you may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name and interest in developing a record of the meeting. Third, all participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the NOVA Agendas platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. So let's see how much of the town's business we can get done this evening. And next on the agenda is the land acknowledgement. I would like to read the land acknowledgement that the board supported in the spring of 2021, and that was adopted at the 2021 annual town meeting. We acknowledge that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe. The tribe of indigenous people from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. We'll now turn to Mr. Hurd, who will explain how we'll handle the third item on the agenda of proclamation honoring Stan Shine. Mr. 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 Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I sort of put this on by accident. Uh, it's not ready. Um, it's going to be pushed to another agenda item when we can have him in. It was meant to uh, honor his 44 years of service as a coach in town, but that will be kicked forward to another agenda item to come. So. All right. Thanks, Mr. Hart. And um, we'll now move to item number four, uh, discussion. Impossible vote on more effectively pressuring or requiring the national grid to repair known significant environmental impact gas leaks. I mean, but before we move forward, I think I, mean, I will hear from Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I am going to recuse myself from this discussion and vote because I'm an employee of the state legislature, specifically in the Massachusetts Senate, which uh, has some oversight role of the utilities. I think that it's best to remove myself from the discussion just to avoid any possible a uh, conflict of interest or appearance of conflict of interest that could affect future actions um, since the legislature has some oversight role of the utilities. Thanks, Ms. Helmuth. And Mr. Corsi? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I also am going to recuse myself from this discussion and possible vote um, as I do with some legal work for National Grid. Um, and consistent with my prior practice, I'll be recusing myself this evening. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. I'll let you know we're all done. We'll just give it a few seconds. So I just want to make it clear that the possible vote is not going to be on the resolution. It's really going to be on whether um, we take some other action. You know, uh, we will, part of the discussion may be whether the resolution comes back on the agenda. Uh, but, uh, but right now, I mean, I'm going to um, turn it over to, um, Ms. Bolin, and uh, to discuss the significance of the gas leaks, I mean, and, and why it is that we are having uh, this discussion now. Ms. Bolin. Thank you. Um, so my name is Ann Boland. I am a member of the Town Managers Gas Leaks Task Force, and I'm also a member of Mothers Out Front. And so the Town Managers Gas Leaks Task Force was formed in 2017 Initially, the gas leaks task force consisted of the town manager, a town engineer, a volunteer from the tree committee, the town tree warden, a volunteer from Sustainable Arlington, 
and two other town residents who are also members of Mothers Out Front. In the first year, representatives from National Grid would occasionally attend. Currently, David Morgan, the town's environmental planner, attends the meetings for the town manager. So an overview of the gas problem in Arlington and in Massachusetts in general, uh, the natural gas distribution infrastructure in Massachusetts is the second oldest and most leak prone in the country. Gas leaks cause explosions, kill trees, and emit methane, which is an extraordinarily potent greenhouse gas. The leaks are also expensive since gas customers pay for the lost gas in their bills. In Massachusetts, we pay up to $135 million every year for leaked gas, according to a 2013 study by Senator Markey. And in the Boston area alone, the value of lost gas is $90 million, enough to heat 200,000 homes. And this is from a Harvard, Boston University, McCain study of 2015. So all of our information on the number of gas leaks that we have in Arlington comes from National Grid. And so uh, I will be putting, telling some of these numbers as, as we go along here, but it has been shown that sometimes independent researchers find more leaks than National Grid actually reports. Weston, the town of Weston had an independent gas audit and they found 66% more leaks, more gas leaks than were reported by National Grid. So in 2017, when the Gas Leaks Task Force was formed, there were 234 reported gas leaks in Arlington. And trees were dying because they're being suffocated by leaked gas. We lost trees along Mass Ave right in front of City Hall, Town Hall, and and uh, right, the current number of gas leaks, uh, as reported by National Grid in the third quarter of 2022, is 198. So methane is the main component of these leaks. An intergovernmental panel on climate change reports that atmospheric methane is now higher than at any time in the last 800,000 years and that methane is 80% 80, 80%, excuse me, 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide in terms of warming the climate. So you can see that the gas leaks problem is something that the gas leaks task force has been, has been working to address. Some of the things that we've accomplished over these years is an increased communication between uh, the town engineering department and national grid. Now they, have better, they can better coordinate when the streets are open for repairs of gas pipelines and, and to avoid duplication and excavations. Uh, we've also helped with the purchase of a portable Bascom Turner gas detector for the tree warden to test for gas in tree pits before he plants new trees. This way we save money because uh, the trees are gonna have more of a chance of survival. The tree warden also keeps an inventory of trees killed by gas leaks. And the way a tree is killed by a gas leak is it's actually suffocated because the, the natural gas uh, replaces the oxygen in the soil. And so the tree can't breathe and that's what, how, why it dies. And so the tree warden has, keeps an inventory of these trees that are killed by gas leaks and has sent bills to National Grid for reimbursement of these trees. Unfortunately, there have been mixed results in getting a fair reimbursement with National Grid sometimes offering just pennies on the dollar for the cost of the trees or claiming that the tree was killed by some type of fungus or some other disease without even uh, showing proof of this. The tree warden along with the town council continue to pursue these reimbursements. And we've also increased public awareness of the problem of gas leaks and the danger of methane gas, both for health and climate change. We've published several articles in local papers, and with the help of Mothers Out Front, gas leaks have been tagged to increase residents' awareness of the prevalence of the gas leaks in Arlington. And Arlington is actually one of the towns 
that has quite a few. We have more gas leaks reported than Cambridge or Somerville. We really are in a, in a high, have a high level of gas leaks. And so what we're asking with this resolution, we feel like this is kind of low hanging fruit as far as uh, addressing the methane emissions. And um, I, I, is it possible that I could show a slide? I don't know if, uh, yeah, can I, uh, I have, okay, I could share my screen. I, I, uh, Ms. Meyer will help you out with that. You know, so. Okay. No problem. You weren't expecting this, so it just give us a little time. Okay, that's, that's okay. I just wanted to talk about, uh, there are, according to the Department of Public Utility Regulations, they have come up with um, ways that gas leaks are classified. So gas leaks are classified by, by uh, grade one, and this is a leak that is dangerous and it needs to be fixed immediately. It's maybe in a, in a home, uh, in a building, uh, in a manhole, somewhere that it, it, it has the potential of immediate danger, and these are to be fixed immediately. Then there's grade two gas leaks, and these have the potential of becoming dangerous, and these are to be fixed within one year. But most of the gas leaks that are in Arlington are grade three gas leaks, and these are gas leaks that are not considered dangerous at all, and if they were discovered, well, they're, they're to be fixed within eight years of their discovery. And then there is grade three SEI gas leaks. And these are significant environmental impact gas leaks. And these are large volume gas leaks. And they have a 2,000 square foot area where the gas can be detected in a 2,000 square foot area from the center of the leak. And so these are the leaks that emit the most methane. And a 2016 Boston University study found that 7% of all leaks are SEI leaks, yet they account for 50% of the methane emissions. So we feel like going after our significant environmental impact leaks is low hanging fruit. You know, it's a way for us to really get our, you know, address a, a large amount of emissions. And so, and uh, as far as the regulation goes, National Grid is, is supposed to repair these within one to two years. Now they have, they have ways that they can get around this, they can, and so these leaks have been well, they probably weren't designated as, as SEIs, even though they have been leaks in Arlington for quite a while. It was only in, uh, I think, 2020 or 2021 that National Grid started designating the large volume gas leaks in Arlington. But we feel that it is, we'd like to push National Grid to uh, really make it a concerted effort to fix these large volume gas leaks. So we are asking that we have a resolution that we have presented and we're asking that this be accepted by the select board and sent on to National Grid that they repair our large volume gas leaks by June of 2023. And our resolution is actually based on 2021 data and there were 14 leaks. Now I just found out today that the, the third quarter data of 2022 reports that there are 21 large volume leaks, which is a very big increase. Um, and again, I think it's, and we feel as far as the addressing methane emissions for Arlington, that it's really important that these leaks are, are fixed. And we also would like town support to verify if National Grid 
reports that they have fixed these leaks that we want to be sure that they really have been fixed. Well, thank you, Dean. And in our conversation, Dean, I mentioned that I would like to find out how we can effectively get National Grid to me to fix these leaks because my 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 comments are that it, uh, it'll be really easy for them to uh, get the resolution and say thank you very much and not do anything else. It, um, and you mentioned, you talked, you told me that um, DPU, the Department of Public Utilities, is the entity that really controls what National Grid does. I mean, and uh, if anything, we should direct our communication to them, in my opinion, I mean, and, um, and in my opinion, that should come from uh, the town manager, the town manager and I had a conversation and, and we're going to discuss um, this some more, maybe, in, not maybe tonight, and, but certainly uh, later on, you know, but what I would like you to maybe discuss before I turn it over to my colleagues are some other possible things that we could do um, in addition to or instead of the resolution that would potentially be more effective? Well, that's a good question. We have um, well, Mothers Out Front has, has tried to do a lot of publicity regarding these large volume gas leaks. Um, you know, it, National Grid is, is pretty, um, you know, we don't have, like you said, it's, and we've talked about the Department of Public Utilities really has the control over um, National Grid. So I guess in terms of maybe just more publicity, uh, more public opinion, getting more public opinion sway uh, towards fixing these large volume gas leaks, which is why I did want to talk about it tonight. Um, uh, right at, off the top of my head, I'm really not coming up with anything else. Um, anything right. yeah. That's fine, that's fine. I mean, so uh, I will turn it over to, to uh, my, my colleagues, I mean, and so on, and Ms. Maha, if you could just maybe raise your hand electronically, that'll help me out a little bit uh, more, you know, and so. Um, oh, okay. So, can I see Mr. Herbert's hand up? Yeah. Mr. Herbert? Yep. Um, thank you for the presentation and the information. I'm certainly on board with what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, I mean, if we want to send the resolution, I think that's fine. I think it's well thought out and well written. I just, I'm not sure that a resolution or proclamation is the best, most effective way to get the utilities to take us seriously on this subject. I think a demand letter, what, I'm not sure if we sent them before, I'm sure we have, is more in tune to get them to get to their legal department. But, you know, being a lawyer by practice, an effective demand letter has to have some sort of a consequence for non-compliance, so I guess I would ask Attorney Heim if there's anything that we can put in a letter. We're asking them to resolve these issues by a certain date. Is there anything that we can put in a letter that says, if you don't, we're going to do this, or these are the consequences for non-compliance in such a situation? Mr. Chairman, may I? Yes, please. Yes, yes. So, um, as has been pointed out, what the legal department typically does when we have, uh, we're informed by the tree warden that a tree is damaged or killed uh, by natural gas leak or some other town property is affected by gas leaks, is uh, we support um, or draft or get involved in seeking compensation for those damaged trees. Uh, typically, those things have uh, been uh, handled um, similar to an insurance claim process and uh, haven't risen to the level of some sort of litigation. Um, the town could certainly take a more aggressive posture with respect to litigation, uh, but I want to caution that that litigious posture would be primarily with respect to the direct damage caused to town property by gas leaks. Um, for some of the reasons that we've sort of outlined, uh, the town, absent some sort of special act, uh, doesn't have an avenue for a more straightforward injunctive relief, what would it probably happen is, you know, uh, it would be relayed to us that this is uh, governed by uh, the uh, by a DPU, and the town doesn't have the sort of jurisdiction 
to enforce by injunctive relief uh, a more aggressive schedule or a change in the law in terms of how uh, leaks are, are treated. So the legal department certainly could take a more aggressive posture with respect to uh, damage and make something more public in terms of taking a more, instead of trying to resolve matters, um, going to court. I'm aware that, I'm pretty certain that the city of Newton did that a number of years ago. Um, but uh, there's not a lot of options um, beyond either a special act um, or uh, working more with our legislative delegation to uh, change rules and things like that at the DPU level. Okay. Um, yeah, again, I'm happy to support the resolution and send it. I just feel putting the same tenor into a letter, it gets a little more attention than we tell them that we're sending them a proclamation. But that being said, I'm happy to move approval of the of the proclamation as well. I, I just want to make it clear, um, Mr. Hardy, uh, we're not going to vote on the proclamation tonight. I just have it included as material for us to look at. You know, uh, and so I had a discussion with Ms. Boland because uh, I wasn't ready to put it on the agenda um, for a vote tonight, but I did want to discuss this issue tonight and see if there were some alternatives that we can maybe come up with instead of a. a um, Resolution, you know, and and um, ACMI, can I get the select board room be where the the um, town of Arlington um, seal is? And so, I mean, so so there's a seal that I'm seeing in Zoom. Be and initially it had the chambers, and uh, and if I could get the chamber where the seal is, that'd be good. Because that's the one that lights up when people are talking in the chamber. Okay, we can work on it. Um, Ms. Mahatma. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would have seconded that motion, but I think I'm hearing from the chair that uh, we're not going to do that tonight, um, which is fine. Um, but I, I'm definitely in support of the resolution. Also, um, just trying to think as others are in terms of possible next steps. Um, I don't know if between now and the end of the month when the warrant close, closes, if the town manager gas leak committee um, that Ms. Bolin and others are on, or mothers out front, or the board or some other entity could perhaps come up with some sort of warrant article. I don't know if that would have any teeth to it, um, but I'm sure people are looking at that. And the other thing I would suggest is I know we have um, per discussion of our goals meeting um, coming up soon between now and the next month or so, months or so, um, inviting our legislators in, the senator and, and our two reps. Um, this would certainly be, um, I know when they come in, uh, they give a report from the state house, but they also say, you know, can you give us some marching orders, the things that... Um, you'd like us to work on, and this certainly seems like a, a topic that obviously they're aware of, um, but uh, if we have a little more vigorous discussion about it, as well as when we have them in um, <coughs> the chair, excuse me, it's a head cold, that's all, um, the chair can sort of give them an, a, a brief expected itinerary um, so they, you know, can already be thinking about possible steps. So, uh, with that, uh, if it, when we do vote on the resolution, um, I'd be happy to uh, vote for that. Uh, I don't know if you want to wait and put that on to another meeting, or not, Mr. Chair, because you do have discussion of possible vote. But definitely, if we could think about it, it's a Warren article avenue that, of something we can do, or definitely this should be and probably would be a topic of discussion when we have our legislators into a select board meeting in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mahan. Yes, I mean, I'm going to think about this some more about whether we might um, bring the resolution to uh, a, a vote because my general feeling about resolutions is that I mean, you show your resolve, uh, you don't talk about your resolve. I mean, and so, so there has to be something more, a lot more, I mean, that goes with the resolution and it needs to, and my feelings are it needs to be 
clear, you know, and, and there should be concrete steps, me, that we are going to do, me, that are as effective as they can be, me, you know, and so, so, I mean, I think talking to our state delegates, you know, would be um, one of those things, me, maybe figuring out how to work with other towns in order to do some other kind of suit, you know, uh, so that we can really get not only attention, you know, um, of the public, but also be perhaps the attention of other entities that have an influence in, on um, National Grid. You know, so so as I told Ms. Boland, you know, it would be easy for us to do a resolution and then be done. You know, uh, but I'd rather spend more time really trying to do something effective me than to spend a little time on something that uh, has little to no impact. Uh, Ms. Boland. Yeah, one thing that, excuse me, that I didn't mention that did, is, has become as an offshoot of the town's um, gas leak task force is that uh, the, the local area developed a multi-town gas leaks initiative. And those people also, uh, the town of Newton and Waltham, and it's multiple different towns, Wellesley, uh, Weston, I believe, have met with National Grid and they meet quarterly. It's it's a frustrating situation because um, things don't, I just wanted to let people know that there has been that outreach to other towns. Okay, I appreciate that. So so what this does is this keeps us engaged, Ms. Bowen. You know, uh, so we, we all care very much about this issue, I mean, and I really wanna work it. You know, I mean, so it keeps us engaged I mean, until at least the next meeting I mean, and probably uh, beyond. So, so uh, you and I will certainly be in touch before the next meeting, and maybe uh, you may be in touch with other members of I mean, uh, um, uh, staff. And, even, and of course, you're always welcome to reach out to any other member of the select board. So, so um, thank you for your time tonight I mean, and for all the information. I mean, and um, just let's hopefully hope we can all be successful sooner than later. Okay. Got to keep pushing. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Good night. Good night. Uh, so on to um, item number five, a uh, vote on uh, 10 Sunnyside Avenue 40B. And, uh, uh, Mr. Hine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as the board will recall. Oh, actually, hold on. We need to bring our colleagues back. Sorry, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. You know, so. Uh, All right, looks like everyone's in the room. So Mr. Hine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As the board will recall, uh, you had a, a previous meeting to discuss uh, the board's position with respect to the application. Uh -huh. the so, excuse me a second. ACMI, so right now I have a muted microphone in on the select board chambers, so I'm not hearing anything. And so he gave me the video that I wanted, but now I don't have any audio. All right, if the only way to get audio is to go back to the way we were, we need that, then we'll just have to do that, you know? Sean, on my end, it says that the microphone is not working. Okay. I'll let you know when I can hear the like, for chambers, I still can. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me now? Uh, I have another screen up, and I may need to use that to get audio uh, until you're able to get it back. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? This is Sandy. I'll take Someone this one. There's a no. Uh, Mr. Chair, can you hear me? This is Sandy. I can. Was, did you say yes? Yes. yes. And I'll get rid of that feedback. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, ACMI. Appreciate it. Yes, All right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, yes. I'll be quick. Uh, the board heard an application for uh, site approval slash project eligibility, an opportunity for the board to comment, having received um, some information from your departments regarding a application for a development of an approximately 43-unit affordable rental housing property at 10 Sunnyside Avenue. Based on the board's discussion uh, and my understanding of the board's position, I've drafted a letter of full support. Um, this is a relatively straightforward project, both from the perspective of Massachusetts Smart Growth Criteria and my understanding of the board's um, general positions and appreciation for the Housing Corp of Arlington's um, approach to this, incorporating many of the town's long-term plans into its uh, design and the locus here. Uh, if board members have any comment, I'm happy to make any adjustments or tweaks uh, based on any discussion here. But otherwise, I'd be looking for a vote uh, to approve having the chair sign this and transmit it to Mass Housing. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Heim. Mr. You know, is there any questions, comments, Alex? Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move approval. And... Uh, I was not at the last meeting, so I'd like to take the opportunity to express my own um, appreciation for HDA's innovative thinking for this project. I, I did have the opportunity um, prior to that meeting to spend an hour with them and their and their team, and you know I have full confidence in the ZBA's uh, full vetting of this, and so our role is of course not to supplant that, but you know from what I saw, this this has a lot of promise. Um, I'm very excited about the potential for adding. Uh, deeply affordable housing at, at a great volume. And um, I look forward to seeing the outcome of the due diligence as the process goes forward. Great. Second. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hurd. And, uh, and um, any other comments? Ms. Mahai, um, you raise your hand electronically, I'll call on you. Okay, I think people are all set there. I, mean, I will just uh, ask Mr. Um, Mr. Hyde, and do you think it'd be appropriate to mention the Fair Housing Action Plan as one of the things that this project helps to advance? You know, Mr. Chairman, of course. If you'd like me to highlight the Fair Housing Action Plan, I'd be happy to do so. Okay, great. You know, I, I didn't know if it was left out intentionally, uh, but but I think it'd be good because it means all affordable housing, and certainly one of the issues that was raised in the Fair Housing Action Plan was that we have the it's hard to afford to live in Arlington, and that definitely affects me the the, the makeup of, of the town. So given that this is all affordable housing and some of it deeply affordable, I think it really does help with um our own Fair Housing Action Plan. So yeah, um, at that, I mean, um, I'm already happy with it. I'd be even more related. You know? So uh, I think that's it. So on a motion to approve by Mr. Helmuth and a second by Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Uh, sorry. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. yes. It's unanimous vote. Everybody's sitting in different places, so I... Yeah, I, I, I was, <laughs> I was one way, but... Uh, yeah, but, I was wondering if you almost called Mr. Herb Mr. Helmets, because trust me, yeah. there is someone who really <laughs> identified with that issue. <laughs> so, so, so. Anyways, uh, uh, so uh, I just need to get now the agenda. I mean, there's a little bit of a little scramble here of me just then, and I am... Um, okay, I'm there. So uh, we're now moving on to for approval of... Uh, uh, vote on a dangerous dog carrying request, one of two, so I'll turn it to you, Mr. Hunt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm aware of the, uh, just to give the board and the public a quick refresher on this process, the, what the board is tasked with tonight is you've received two complaints about dangerous dogs. Um, under Chapter 40, Section 157, uh, those petitions have to be submitted in writing to the select board. Typically, um, which is what the board is allowed to do, the board has designated a department um, to investigate and determine whether or not an, 
a dog is dangerous in violation of state law and the town's bylaws. Um, and again, typically that has historically been the police department. Uh, the board certainly can uh, investigate on its own and have its own hearings, or the board may decide that there's not a sufficient basis uh, to cause an investigation to happen. But again, your practice has typically been to refer this to uh, the police department. The police department will notice and hold a formal hearing where evidence can be presented by the party complaining about uh, the dangerous, uh, about an allegedly dangerous dog and the uh, dog owner and any other witnesses who wish to sort of be present and provide uh, evidence. Uh, again, typically these hearings have been fairly uh, formal hearings in the sense that they have a court reporter, there's a transcript generated, and um, the evidence is all considered before an initial determination is made as to whether or not the animal is in fact dangerous in any way, uh, and then secondly, what is the appropriate measure going forward to, um, uh, if the animal is dangerous, to uh, appropriately uh, mitigate that risk. So um, if the board has any other questions, I'm happy to answer them, but the process tonight is, is, is fairly straightforward. It's will the board cause an investigation into one or both of these complaints? And if it does, will it designate the police department? You have some other options, but again, traditionally it's been the police department to serve, to appoint a hearing officer to preside over that process. Thank you, Sean. Any questions, comments from my colleagues? Mr. Scorsese. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a question, Mr. Chair. Are we considering both six and seven, or do you want us to consider six first and then go into to agenda item seven? And so, uh, that's a good question. So, I will ask Mr. Heim, I mean, does, I, mean, I assume what you said applies to both six and seven, right? Yes, my apologies, Mr. Chair. Yes, I would take, a, I would consider each separately and take a separate vote on each one of them. Okay, thank you, Attorney Heim. I, I have a question really on seven, and it, it has to do with jurisdiction, and question for Attorney Heim, and, and I'm fine with the referral to the police department, particularly for number six. But I think there's a threshold question on number seven, if, if whether the dog is kept in Arlington. And so is that within the scope of what we would be asking the police department to look into it, or, or are we making that initial um, determination? Hi. Thank you, uh, Mr. DeCourcy. It's my understanding that this incident took place in Arlington, that the, um, Owner of the dog is not necessarily an Arlington resident, um, but that the sort of locus of the event was here and that the dog may be being kept um, in another jurisdiction, but at the request of the Arlington Police Department. So I think we do have jurisdiction over the incident itself and the, and the dog. I don't believe the dog is licensed anywhere. So um, unless I'm mistaken, I don't believe the dog is licensed anywhere. So the only other alternative here would be to not have any jurisdiction for this dog whatsoever. So I believe that in a less than perfect circumstance, Arlington is an appropriate place uh, to have a hearing with respect to whether the dog is dangerous or not. Okay, thank you, Attorney. I, I'm, I'm just concerned that at a hearing and, and the incident, it was a terrible incident with the, with, well, in both instances, but, um, that the police department may find that they don't have any authority based on where the dog is at the time of the hearing. But that is something that can be addressed at the hearing, is that? The dog um, is registered in the town of Arlington. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, no, mistake. thank okay. you. Both six and seven? Uh, just the offender of seven. Okay, okay, all right. Then that, that answers that question. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Martin. Uh, any other questions, comments from our colleagues? And Ms. Mahan, I can actually even see you now, so you can raise your hand one way or another. Uh, okay, I mean, uh, so, um, is it on? Yes. No problem, take your time. Sorry, I have, I have the delay and I have to do the audio through my phone. Um, uh, per the uh, recommendation of town council, I'll just start with the agenda item six. I'd like to make a motion to uh, refer um, Agenda item six to the Arlington Police Department to properly notice and conduct an initial dog hearing. Thank you, Ms. Mahan. Um, so, am I seeing a second? 
Second. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mr. Hurd. And, uh, so, um, any questions, comments? So, well said. So, on the motion, is behind, um, and second by Mr. Hurd, we need to uh, refer to, uh, to the police department uh, for a hearing. And, um, Mr. Hyman. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Corsi? Yes. Mr. Hellman? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. yes. It's a unanimous vote. Great. So, um, so that was for number six. Number seven? Move to refer to the police department per Attorney Hem's recommendation. So I'm much more sure. And I see Ms. Mahan hands up. Uh, second. 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 Ms. Mahan. And for formality purposes, uh, any questions, comments from colleagues? Okay, I think we're all set there. So, Mr. Hunt. No, so, on the motion to um, uh, to refer to the police department, by Mr. Hurd and second by Mr. Hunt. Mr. Hunt. If I may, I just want to interject that technically what's happening is they are referring for investigation and hearing by the police department. An official notice will be sent by the police department pursuant to the board's vote. Should the board vote this way? Uh, Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes, and I appreciate that, appreciate that, that clarification, Mr. Hyman. Thank you. All right, you know, so we are now on to the consent agenda, meeting number eight, minutes, meetings of minutes, minutes of meetings made on December 21st, 2022nd, and the 21st, December 21st, 2022, 2022 emergency addendum, and number nine, uh, the Arlington Education Foundation 5K raise on May 21st of this year. Uh, Laura Fuller of the Arlington Education Foundation. Number 10, a request a special one day beer and wine license on January 14, 2023, at Robbins Library for a private event. Caitlin Perkins. And number 11, a reappointment to the Transportation Advisory Committee. Shoji Takashaki, Takahashi, term to expire on January 31st, 2025. I turn to my colleagues. Yes, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I have a question about the oh. item, in, item number nine, and I just noticed uh, that the application did not answer the, did not check the box either way about police detail, but the accompanying letter mentioned that that was the intention. Uh, that was my first question. My second question is I noticed that there was no um, statement from the recreation director or the police department of support or notes or, or you know, concerns and conditions. And I realize this is kind of a, a, re, a repeat, with, but with an expansion of last time. So I think all, all I've seen is is the, uh, the very fine you know the applicants um, organizations attestation of this. But I guess my question, my second question is that is that usual for us to approve in the absence of of a formal formal information from the town departments, um, and then my, back to and, my, and then to remind my first question is um, is that an issue about the police detail on the form? So it's a, all that boils down to is, is is that ready for us to improve to approve? So I'll turn to Ms. Meyer. Yes. If I may, Laura Fuller, the applicant, the per petitioner is here if you would like me she's now a panelist if you would like me to allow her to speak pertaining to mr helmuth's questions sure thank you okay. mr mr chair i think yes. before i think that would be welcome but before that though i think there's an administrative and uh and policy question for uh, the town manager or or attorney heim um at your discretion that I, I think you know might i mean i, I certainly want to know what the applicant uh has to say but but in terms of the policy issues i quite i raised I'm not sure I have an answer off the top of my head about whether or not they can proceed if they haven't, you know, uh, technically filled out the requirements that way. I don't know if the manager has a position on it. If the board is inclined to correct essentially an application, um, I think the real issue is just whether or not we have the information uh, to satisfy the board before you make your vote. Mr. Manager, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, 
this is the first time I've had to deal with a road race like this, so uh, I will just say that. I had been contacted by the petitioner earlier where she informed me that she'd been in contact with the police and so forth, but um, uh, I think maybe having her answer the, some of those questions directly. Um, what I see from the attachment to the agenda is a permit application with nothing on it. I don't know if that's what you see too. It's just the form. I thought I saw. Yeah, my version is is partly filled out. Yeah, yeah. It could be a PDF reading issue on the iPad. Yeah. Well, well, my intention was to see if the applicant could answer some of these questions. I understand the administrative element of it, but I was hoping that you may be able to fill in some some information from our dealing with the police department, maybe other entities in town. So, Ms. Fuller. Yes, good evening, thank you. Um, my name is Laura Fuller. I am a member of the board of the Arlington Education Foundation. Um, and we'd like to thank the board for um, consideration and, uh, and for the approval for last year's race, which was quite successful. Um, honestly, uh, we, our intention is uh, to hire a police detail. Um, honestly, I filled out this form uh, similarly to the way I filled it out last year, which did not check that box until um, at the completion of this um, process here tonight. Um, but our intention is um, to hire a police detail uh, to help us manage traffic, uh, especially on the bike path. Um, what we found last year is we had a lot of um, cyclists um, pedaling against the, the direction of the race. And that was an issue um, as well as controlling traffic um, and that was primarily around stop and shop uh, when they had some deliveries early in the morning. Um, I'd like to remind the board that this race is at 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Um, and honestly, Mass Ave is quite quiet on a Sunday morning at that hour. It's only like at the end of the race where it picks up. But yes, we will. We intend to engage a police detail. I have um, been in contact with uh, the Joe Conley of the Recreation Department. Um, as well as Sandy Pooler and and the folks at the police department about this race and they've all approved it. Mr. Jeremy. So, Mr. Hummus, yes, Mr. Hummus. Uh, thank you, Ms. Fuller. And I'm, I'm thrilled that the uh, event was so successful that you want to expand it year, this year. That is wonderful, wonderful news and we'll, we'll certainly get this done. Um, to my colleagues, I, I think I would feel better hearing directly, not that I have any reason to doubt what we've just heard at all, but just as a mm -hmm. matter of procedure, given how we normally do permits, uh, having something written from Officer Rateau and from Mr. Conley, um, just just uh, verifying that and, and inviting any comments that they have about advice to the board for conditions. Um, I would prefer to see that before with that, as long as, long as this does not mess up the timeline, um, you know, for doing any, and it seems like this is pretty well in advance. Um, is that something we could do perhaps in our next meeting? Mr. Corsi? Yeah, th th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I um, agree with Mr. Helmuth on this. And, and we have done in situations where the event is coming up between meetings. So, so let's say if this event was next Saturday and we're not meeting again until January 23rd, we might make a conditional type approval. And I, I was happy to support this last year. I'm glad the event was successful and I'm inclined to vote in favor of it again. But I think where we do have time, um, I, I, would, I would agree with Mr. Helmut that, that maybe it's best just for us to have the complete document at our meeting on January 23rd and, and, and vote again, vote at that time. So um, if, if you're taking Mr. Helmut's comments as a motion to table this or continue it, I'll second it. So moved. Okay, um, any um, comments, questions, colleagues? Okay, so it, I guess maybe to help you know, um, the police department, Mr. Helmus, I mean, um, I mean what, what is it that you would like for them to say? I mean, like what level of detail you know, um, would you like from them so that it meets your satisfaction? Um, I would just, you know, I just appreciate so, uh, something written from each of them, um, indicating their approval, uh, indicating at their option, any comments they want to make, any recommendations they want to make to the board for further conditions. So if they say, I approve no comments, that will be sufficient? Yeah. Sure. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Just, just, just understand so that we don't get to, to next week, you know, or next meeting, and it's not enough information. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Sounds great. Cool. Sure. Um, you know. And all right, so on uh, a motion to table till the next meeting, you know, well, hold on, I guess I, I might need to uh, untangle this meet from, from the rest of the consent agenda because it's part of the consent agenda. So I think we're gonna pull this element out, you know, the consent agenda and deal with it separately. You know, so uh, any other comments on the consent agenda? Well, I actually have a question. Oh, Ms. Mahan, yes. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that I'd like to move approval of items 8, 10, and 11 on the consent agenda. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll second that and just say okay. happy birthday to the gentleman who's having his party, and it reminds me that my 40th birthday is coming. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if I'll have it at Town Hall, but getting old. <laughs> <laughs> not hearing it, you know, so, uh, so uh, there was an item I need to get to it. So uh, I guess it was on that party, actually, I have a question, because it's really a matter of consistency with a, uh, maybe it was on uh, two consent agendas ago, uh, where they said that he, they were going to take their alcohol home, you know, or, or in a car, and, and, and <laughs> to my surprise, you know, we, we said no. You know, uh, and so is that the same thing that's going on here? I mean, and is there a consistency issue with it, or, or is there something different about this one? Um, uh, Mr. DeCourcy. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I think the last time what was said is at the end of the event that each, each person who visited the event will be provided with some alcohol to take home with them in their car. Right. This right, is right, the right. manager who's going to place unopened bottles in the trunk of the client's vehicle. I, 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 I think that's, that I'm not really worried about consistency based on that. Okay, fine, fine. No, thanks for the clarification. I'm glad I asked, you know, so. Okay, you know, so then, you know, I think we all discussed this one all out. So on a motion to approve elements uh, eight, 10, and 11 of the consent agenda um, by Mrs. Mahan, and second by Mr. Hurd, uh, Mr. Hein. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Helm? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Yes. Vote. Thank you. And so now on, on item number nine of the consent agenda, we have a motion to table to uh, our next meeting by Mr. Helm and a second by Mr. DeCourcy. Uh, uh, Mr. Heim? Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Helm? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Unanimous vote. Okay, great. Thank you. And so we're now on to open forum. Except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall need to be acted upon, nor a decision made in night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or a request. So, um, Ms. Meyer, we, well, first off, uh, we have the that wants to chime in. I'm looking at the participants list. I'm not, oh, okay, we're seeing uh, Susan, Susan. <laughs> so uh, uh, we'll, we'll, of course, bring in um, Ms. Susan, you know, and if you have the clock ready, you know, we'll start that. Hi there. Hi, everybody. I'm going to hang on just a little bit and I'm waiting to see if um, Ms. Meyer can get us a clock. If not, I'll, I'll bring up my phone and get a little time going on that. Okay, there we go. Okay, there we go. Okay, um, Ms. Stamps, you can start any time. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, I am, I just wanted to follow up on Anne Boland's uh, terrific presentation of the gas leaks resolution you spoke about earlier in the meeting. Yes. I am the tree committee representative on the gas leaks task force and have been since the beginning five years ago. 
Um, there were a couple of items in the resolution that I wanted to highlight that was not discussed when you just discussed it. Uh, the first is that um, we shopped this resolution around to boards and it is, it is endorsed by a, a very impressive uh, group of boards and I'd like to read the boards uh, in town that um, endorsed it and those are Conservation Commission, the School Committee, the Board of Health, Arlington Fire Department, Park and Rec Commission, the Open Space Committee, Tree Committee, Sustainable Arlington, and Clean Energy Future Committee. Um, so I, these committees represent a wide swath of people um, doing all kinds of things in Arlington. And I think um, I, 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 would, I would ask the board that when it has a chance to please reconsider doing what the resolution asks, which is that the board um, adopt the resolution and uh, and then send a copy of the resolution with a letter to National Grid, um, which asks them with, within 30 days of the date of the letter to commit to repairing the date, the leaks before J uh, June, 30, June 30th, 2023. So it's a very specific ask. Um, we ask that the select board um, uh, copy our um, state delegation, the, um, the, the DPW superintendent, Department of Planning and Community Development, also, and the Department of Health and Town, and also our public information officer, also the chair, Mr. Nelson, the chair of the State Department of Public Utilities, and finally, to place a copy of the letter um, in Arlington Advocate, your Arlington patch and ACMI and the Boston Globe. And the whole point of this is, um, and also I want to mention that other cities and towns have, have um, signed a similar resolution and sent it to, um, um, as I, to the people that I just mentioned. And the whole idea is to raise um, consciousness and to really put pressure on. Um, the DPU is, is not putting much pressure on National Grid and National Grid is trying as hard as it can to pretend that it is helping things instead of not helping things for us to get to a greener future. So um, I just wanted to mention those and I think that was, that's all I had to say. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Thames. Anyone else? That's it. So, um, actually, I see uh, Andrew Meyer. Sorry, I just have to get back there. No problem. Hello, um, is my audio working? Yes. Okay. And we'll just hang on a second while we have the clock. Go right ahead. All right. Yeah. Please start. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to follow up on the second da dangerous do dog hearing t tonight, which I submitted with my mother. Um, it was item seven on the, on the agenda. So, um, this incident involved our fam fam family dog that was um, killed in an unprovoked attack uh, uh, on November 16th of last year. Um, and this and the caretaker of the attacking dog um, was a resident of Drake B Village, which is a public housing building um, for Arlington residents. Um, from the police report, it says that, quote, he stated Ziggy, the attacking dog, was not his dog. Rather, he was sitting full for its owner and that he did not know where she lived or when she was coming back to retrieve Ziggy. So I'm bringing this up because it seems like from the reports, um, Ziggy was being kept at Drake Village, um, which is managed by the Arlington Housing Authority, and they have specific rules about registering and restraining dogs. Um, so I emailed the manager of Drake Village and also the executive director of the Arlington House, House, Housing Authority, and um, I do appreciate that they responded back quickly about my concerns. Um, however, 
Um, I didn't get that clear of an answer about what kind of action steps might be being taken about prevention of um, of incidents like this in the future, especially considering that Drake Village houses um, elderly and disabled residents. And this incident took, took, took place right next to the Arlington Re Reservoir and Herd Field, where families with small children and pets um, walk uh, on, a, on a daily basis. Um, uh, and it seems like a similar event could, could, could occur again if another resident of Drake Village decides to take in a similarly dangerous animal and it's not flagged. So um, I'm not sure if, if this is the best place to address this issue, but I just wanted to raise this concern um, in case this, this elect board has ways to um, help with public safety issues uh, like that. Uh, so that's it. Thank you for your comments. I'm not seeing any other hands, Ms. Meyer. Are you? Uh, I just gotta get back. No problem. Mm -hmm. Take time. No, I don't see any other hands raised at this time. Great. So I think we are set with open forum, and uh, I just need to get to speak. That's my agenda. So next appointment is um, Board of Health. Uh, so we have uh, Peter Rice. Is Mr. Rice with us? Yes, yes. good evening. Hi. Hi, Mr. Rice. Uh, so thank you for your willingness to be a uh, member of the Board of Health. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Peter? Yes, I'm a, a Bostonian, actually. Uh, I went to uh, Northwestern University undergrad and then to uh, Boston University for uh, medical school, and I trained at UMass in Worcester. I uh, married a New Yorker and uh, I was taken uh, behind enemy lines for 25 years. And uh, two years ago, we moved back to the Boston uh, area. While I was a, uh, a surgeon physician for about 25 years, I became interested in teaching. Uh, so I made a transition to uh, teaching um, actually uh, high school students. Uh, I became interested in public health as a way to teach uh, students about uh, critical thinking and uh, evidence-based med medicine and trying to get them uh, interested uh, in this. Um, and, and so I participated uh, in, in a, a, a couple of uh, times uh, down at, at CDC in uh, Atlanta for teachers. Um, and um, I, be, I became quite taken uh, with uh, public health and teaching about public health. And uh, as you know, over the last uh, two and a half years, uh, this has been uh, quite, a, quite an issue. And so I would like to uh, become a part of uh, government in the sense that that I that I would like to see how this works, and I think the skills that I have, um, I, I could be a part of this. So uh, we've enjoyed living in Arlington, and that's why I applied. Well, thank you, Mr. Rice. I mean, so I will turn to my colleagues. Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. Rice, uh, for your willingness to serve and your fascinating career. I think it's terrific, uh, the, the direction your career has taken. The education is really important. The critical thinking is really important. Public health is deeply important, and I am grateful for your willingness to serve your community. I move approval, Mr. Chair. Second. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, anyone else? Comments? Questions? And yes, I want to express my appreciation to the teaching element. I mean, I think it's just really great, you know, because uh, I think you know, along with making decisions, I mean, the ability to explain the decisions you know, uh, means a lot. And, 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 and you know, the, the public health these days is really important, but it also can be a little tricky, you know, given that, you know, 
uh, the extent to which I mean, science I mean, is um, it's having to compete with politics a bit, you know, when it comes to uh, policy making. So, so um, thank you for your willingness um, to persuade to um, to have yeah, to be a member of the Board of Health. So, on a motion uh, to approve by Mr. Helmus and a second by Mr. Hurd. Mr. Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Helmut. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. yes. It's a unanimous vote. Thank you again. Yeah. Take care. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair and the select board. I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Right. Yeah. So we have our second approval. That one up. And that is um, Ms. Sherry Graham, uh, approved for the Council of Aging, Aging term to expire on June 30th, 2025. Ms. Graham here. I'm just unmuting myself, sorry. No problem. Hi, right. so um, you wanna tell us a little about yourself, Ms. Graham? Mm -hmm. Yep, so I'm Sherry Graham. I'm an applicant uh, for the Council on the Aging Board position. I've been a resident of Arlington since 2003. Um, I have a 16 and 18 year old now. So now that my kids are older, I have a chance uh, to go back to volunteering more. Um, and I was interested in being more involved with the town and giving back to the town that's given so much to us. Um, and also a position that uh, could potentially um, leverage my experience as a family physician. Um, I've had numerous experiences um, working in hospice, in hospitals, assisted livings, home visits, nursing homes um, that have definitely led to an appreciation of the importance of community supports for seniors um, and definitely a passion about improving aging in place. Well, thank you, Ms. Graham. You know, so I am um, turning to my colleagues. This is Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I'd like to move approval and uh, thank Dr. Graham for, for her interest in, in the Council on Aging and, and uh, you have a very impressive resume and you, thank you for your work in primary care too. It's so important uh, to be out in, in, in the community and uh, as a, the liaison to the Council on Aging, assuming there's an affirmative vote, I look forward to seeing you at the meetings. So, uh, Mr. Helmuth, second that. Any other questions, comments, or colleagues? Okay. Yes, well, I, I'll just add, it's really great to have me, uh, another doctor be in, in, in uh, an important um, position in town. I mean, council on aging you know, um, is, is critical, you know, uh, especially since all of us hope to uh, be old enough be to, to uh, be a benefit of the, the services that are offered by town. I mean, I, I have, I pretty much focus on transportation being um, in other aspects of my um, civic life. I mean, uh, and, and um, the transportation for elderly folks is a, is a big deal. I mean, I mean, so you just become more aware of the needs of elderly, elderly people and, and just I mean, how, how um, important it is to have a good, functioning council on aging, so I'm sure you will make it um, better. So thank you once again. So on a uh, motion to approve uh, by Mr. DeCourcy and a second by Mr. Helmuth, uh, Mr. Hunt. Mr. DeCourcy, I'm sorry, Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Davies. Yes. yes. Can I stop just looking to the right and just go down the line? Uh, it's unanimous, <laughs> unanimous vote. Uh, as I said, thank you. As I said, Mr. Heim, I totally understand. Yeah, so, uh, okay, uh, we're moving on to traffic rules and order for the business on number 14, a brief discussion, brief 17, service reduction. So, as you all may recall, I think it was about towards the end of December, and uh, there was an announcement that the MBT was reducing its service on 77, especially during the morning rush. And I was able to find out through a very good source because I've done some work um, with the 
MBTA on the Rider Oversight Committee, and I've gotten to know a fair number of people there, especially in service planning, that what happened is that they reduced uh, they reduced the number of buses on the 77 route by one uh, during the morning rush hour, um, and that uh, took what took what's called the headway, it, uh, uh, which is the amount of time between uh, buses from nine and a half minutes to 11 minutes. And, and the rationale is that the, they, we, they don't have enough drivers for one, it, uh, but also there is absenteeism, and, uh, which has been a problem for a while, uh, even before the pandemic. It, but that hits the 77. Um, particularly hard because the 77 is the only bus, uh, key bus routes that used to be called um, coming out of the garage the, that serves the, the area, um, well, serves our area. The, so when a driver is missing on another route the, that may have a headway the, of a half hour or so because there are only two buses on that route, the, then they are going to pull a bus uh, from from the 77. We so so there's so the hope is that we, that by deploying we, a driver to another route or having at least another driver that you can deploy to another route, it will make the 77 service more reliable. We, so uh, it may be a little slower. I mean, nine eleven minutes versus nine and a half, we, but it is better you know, than having the big gaps that happen when you have to take a bus away because not only does that often cause be a gap, but it's not an, an even gap because when you pull that driver out, it, uh, it causes a bit of a domino effect. Me, so, so that's what's going on. You know? So I just wanted to explain that. You know? And I had a conversation with um, Representative Garbley, and he um, confirmed that he had the same information. And then I am going to try to get um, Representative Garbley to um, come and talk with us, you know, not only about the service on the 77, but also um, um, what we can do, what, what's likely to happen about assessments and when I mean and so so I can't promise when that'll happen. I'll just say that uh, myself and Rep um, Garbley are in contact fairly frequently in mean, about MTA um, services and and the services in Arlington in particular. So uh, that's my point of information. So I will happily entertain questions, comments, advice, suggestions. Uh, Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the explanation. I just want to acknowledge the, the number of emails and, and calls that have we have received from people who are concerned about the, um, the lengthier times, particularly during rush hour. And, and uh, I understand there's a, there's a problem with labor. And I also heard what the incoming Governor Healy said last week about wanting to hire more employees for the T. But I, I think um, we should continue to look at this and, and show concern because at 77, as you know, Mr. Diggins, is a very important route. It's a, it's a um, very important route for our students in the morning, for people going to work as well. And, and so to the extent that um, I know there's a shortage of drivers, but I, I, I think we should continue to press for um, as good a service as we can possibly get on this line um, because of the frequency and the number of people who, who uh, rely on it. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Gorsi. Um, anyone else? Okay. Well, I mean, this is the end of this. I mean, as I said, I mean, I've been in touch with uh, Representative Carberly, and we definitely want to have more conversations with the uh, team, but also um, uh, with um, the, the legislature to find out what is going to happen with uh, assessments and when. I mean, uh, and um, I, I could talk about T-Stop a whole lot, especially you know, the, uh, the utilization of it by students, but, but maybe we'll just have a, a have that issue on the agenda with maybe other parties to participating um, in the conversation. So, all right, I mean, uh, so I will move on to the next item, and that is an update on the town manager uh, search process. So uh, this will be quick. Uh, where we are, 
on schedule and potentially we may potentially be uh, ahead of schedule especially if things go uh, next week as we uh, hope they will be in and so I just created the space here in case I need to provide more of an update, but thankfully, you know, in my um, conversation with the consultant yesterday, um, we feel that we're in good shape, and so uh, that will segue us. Well, first, I'll just stop and ask any questions, comments. Okay, okay. okay. and so um, we'll move on to item number 16 and that is hopefully a approval of uh, town manager screening committee and so uh, uh, i had a conversation uh, with corsi yesterday that led to some follow-up conversations today you know and uh, for the second staff person for well we have the superintendent she agreed um, early on uh, to be a member of the screening committee uh, and for the staff Christine Bongiorno uh, the director of health and human services I mean, we very much um, be happy to um, be a part of the screening committee and we will also have um, Karen Malloy and um, the uh, director of um, HR and uh, who will be a part of the screening committee in ex officio position, so she will not be voting, but she will be there to um, just give advice based on her long and wide experience um, with the town. And then so, so um, with that, we, uh, we have myself um, and Ms. Mahan um, last meeting told us that uh, she's going to have Kate Leary. So I think we're now waiting to hear from uh, Mr. Hurd, Mr. Helmuth and Mr. Corsi, uh, who their representatives or who they have selected. So I'll start with Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am pleased that Dan Dunn has um, accepted my invitation to be a member of the screening committee. So I nominate former select board member, Mr. Dunn. Thank you. Oh, man, not him. <laughs> <laughs> um, I realize it's a controversial pick. <laughs> no, of course, we love Dan. Am I next? Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes I'm sorry. You were talking to me. Sorry. Yes, please, sir. Uh, no worries. Sorry. Um, I am happy. I, I spoke with Jennifer Goodwin today, who from Arlington, very well known and well respected, and uh, as someone whose opinion I certainly hold in very high regard. She accepted, thankfully. She was concerned about the meetings conflicting with her son's hockey games, but I told her. I would never expect her to uh, miss hockey games on account of the meeting. So I am sure that the committee will will schedule around that. Um, so I'm happy that, she, that she's, she'll be part of the process. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Corson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, and I'm happy to, to announce that they, my selection, and she has accepted, is Emily Shea, uh, Arlington resident and a, and a business owner here in town. Okay. So, um, with that, we, I think we have a set screening committee meet up, and so uh, can I get a motion from someone to approve that screening committee? If you need me to go through the names again, I will, but I think, um, Ms. Ms. Smart. If you could just go through the names one more time for the record, just so I have a clear statement of the committee when writing the minutes. Sure, sure. And so, so we will have um, su superintendent, um, Elizabeth Mahoman yep. and, uh, and Christine Boincherno, uh, Karen Malloy in ex officio position, and uh, um, Kate Leary, uh, Dan Dunn, Jane Good Goodwin, or Jennifer. Jess Jennifer, sorry, Jennifer, Jennifer Goodwin, and, uh, and Emily Shea. Thank you. And myself. And myself. Yeah. Yes. I see Mrs. Mahan. Hand is up. Ms. Mahan. Yes, uh, first I'd like to move approval and if I could ask the chair or the human resources director, Ms. Malloy, to the chair um, after tonight, sometime this week, it's sort of pro forma that uh, all the committee members receive some correspondence. Um, I had originally told my I told Kate Cleary when she asked about the time commitment, I said four to six hours, but I think I'm hearing maybe six to eight. So um, 
I did follow up with her about that, but it's, and, and also, so just a letter to the committee members so they know who the other people are, the estimated time commitment, as well as uh, that the meetings will be, I assume, remote, either hybrid or remote, um, considering uh, current conditions we're in. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, yes, Ms. Mahan, you know, and, and certainly the first meeting is going to be all remote and, and, and unless, yeah, and the, 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 the committee will then decide how it will handle at least uh, its remaining um, meetings. Mean, and and um, the time commitment, mean, I would say, I mean, probably to count on eight, you know, and so, so all right. Um, so, um, so we have a, move, a motion for approval by Ms. Mahan. And second. second by Mr. Hurd. Um, any other questions, comments? Okay, so on a motion by Ms. Mahan and second by Mr. Hurd to approve this meeting committee, Mr. Hunt. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Corsi? Yes. Mr. Hellman? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. yes. Right. Yeah. So, uh, and with with this, I mean, I think this will keep us, I mean, on track for maybe being a little bit ahead of schedule. Uh, so hopefully, we'll have that first meeting next week. And so, uh, so with this, we now move on to item number seventeen and update on the overnight parking pilot. And, and so, um, <clears throat> I take it you have seen and hopefully read I mean, uh, the. Uh, memo by by Mr. Cooler. I'm going to drop it hopefully because I know you have. You know, uh, it was a good memo, nice and concise. You know, and and so I'll, I'll ask Mr. Cooler if he wants to to um, say anything. Um, so first, just a matter of process. I believe that there was a technical glitch with uh, Nova's agenda, and that. It was to, and only recently that the memo was yeah. available to other members. So given that, um, I think it might be appropriate for me to give a brief recap to the members of what's in the memo, if that's all right with you, Mr. Chair. Wow. I mean, and so after I said we dropped the hopefully, you know, <laughs> it was in total confidence I'd find out they didn't have me because of the glitch. That's fine. Of course, Mr. Bullard, please do. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I had met with the police chief, the fire chief, and the DPW director, and also had a side conversation with uh, Joan Roman, uh, our um, chief information officer, about uh, some of the issues around overnight parking. Uh, so there were several questions that uh, Chair Diggins had posed to me uh, a while ago, which I shared with those people, and uh, I want to share their responses with you tonight. Uh, first question was whether this pilot should be townwide or in East Arlington only. Uh, the police chief had strong feelings that sh this should be a townwide program. Uh, one, because it would be sort of fairer to all residents around town. Um, and the other is that even though there's sort of more of a need for uh, on street parking in East Arlington, the police department actually gets more of its complaints from residents uh, west of Pleasant Street. And so it was her feeling, and I think other members of the police department, that if we're going to open things up, um, it should be all across the town. The second issue was whether there would be one side or two side parking, uh, and everybody agreed that overnight parking should be only on uh, one side at a time. The next issue was whether there was, should be a fee or how big that fee should be. There was not a consensus about that issue. Uh, there were some people who were in favor of having no fee and some people who thought that there should, uh, there should be some sort of fee. Um, there was some concern about the ability of lower income residents to afford a fee. Um, I think there was also a consensus that if there were a fee waiver program, uh, we would have to have clear rules uh, to be easily applied uh, by whichever staff, and in my memo, I, I suggested it be the select board staff that administer this, but whichever staff administer it need to have clear rules about how, how to waive those fees uh, and what those criteria should be. Um, 
permit, it's preferable to issue an uh, overnight parking permit and to require the permittees to register their contact information, in other words, their email address and their, uh, uh, or their telephone number, so that the town can contact them in case of a snow emergency, overnight street sweeping, or, or the need to move their cars off the street for any other reason. Um, I would just mention that um, in certain parts of town, we do do street sweeping overnight um, just because cars are off the street. Um, and that's an important thing for uh, DPW to get that done. Um, so I think what we would uh, want to do is require all those people to get a permit to sign up through Arlington Alerts, which is a system that we use for, for notifying people now. There was some discussion about signage. There was no consensus on that issue. Uh, some people thought it would be necessary to put signs throughout town from a customer service point of view, uh, 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 notifying people that overnight parking would be allowed by a permit. Frankly, other people did not think that that was necessary and noted that uh, in other communities they don't do signage all over the place. Um, I will say if we were to post signs, that would be a major undertaking. Uh, if DPW were to do it uh, across the whole town, it would it would li literally take several months um, just with their own staff, and they might even they suggested they might even want to bring somebody in. So uh, if we went with signage, um, that would be a major decision. Um, moving cars off the street is essential that the town be able to move cars off the street uh, for plowing, in particular, uh, a car left on the street after a during a snowstorm can be a major impediment to plowing and could limit the mm. access of traffic and public safety vehicles, particularly um, fire vehicles, to move down the street. Um, we are able to ticket cars, but we are not able to tow them, particularly during a snowstorm. So uh, I just wanted to raise that as an issue. I don't think it's a defining issue, but I think in any pilot, it would be essential to see how many cars are obeying the, the calls to be pushed, pulled off the street. Um, so uh, notifications, I already mentioned um, requiring people to sign up for Arlington Alerts, where they would receive uh, text, emails, or phone calls for snow emergencies or targeted uh, notifications for street sweeping. Um, other communities have other notifications, such as flashing lights at major intersections. If you were ever in Somerville during a major snowstorm, you see those. Um, if the town were to do some sort of permanent overnight parking system, um, investing in something like that uh, would, A, need an appropriation, and we would need to cost that out. Um, but I do think thinking about how we notify people is an ongoing issue. And finally, we did discuss the period of the pilot program. Uh, there was strong consensus that an overnight parking program should start during warm weather, i.e. not during the snow season. Um, and we thought that perhaps a program starting this spring and running through the fall would supply good data to be able to evaluate the pilot. Um, and then at some point, if that seemed like a positive thing, uh, having a further program that starts during snow season um, would be appropriate. That is the sum of those conversations and my memo, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you, Mr. Fuller. Before we go to questions, I'll ask Mr. Forsey you know, if he wants to make any comments. Um, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd, I'd just like to thank uh, Mr. Pooler for the memorandum and, and for meeting with the um, Department heads, police chief, fire chief, and DPW director. We had had discussions previously. Um, we had run a forum, uh, Mr. the chair and I, and we had received questions on a number of these topics. And in a meeting that the chair and I had with the town manager, they also came up. So I appreciate that this being in a format and and having that that input. Um, and just from Based on what I had said previously, I, I support moving forward with a pilot. It's not, there are still some things to be worked out here. The big thing in my mind is, is the fee, um, where, where we may go with that. And um, 
certainly on, on signage, if we're having a pilot program, I wouldn't be in favor of widespread signage because I think we, we gather information first. But I think one of the purposes here is to get the information to the other members of the board and to, to hear how they react to it too because you and I have been closer to this than the other members, but uh, hopefully this helps that discussion process. Thank you. And I'll just say, I think, you know, well, maybe I shouldn't say anything now. Yeah, I'll wait. You know, so I'll turn it over to my colleagues if we need more questions, comments. Mr. Hart. Um, thank you for the memo. It was concise, but very meaty as well. Um, yeah, I think I agree with just about everything in there and have some thoughts on some of the outstanding issues that, I mean, we'll address at some point. Um, I don't. I think we'll all probably come to the consensus that we don't want to, to put the burden on the DPW for town-wide signage. I would anticipate that some of our uh, our athletic fields would be in disrepair for a few months if that were the case. Um, one question, so you mentioned Somerville, and I spent a little time in Somerville myself, and twice a month we'd all walk outside and half our cars would be gone when it was street sweeping day, and they were able to tow cars. So what is it in Arlington that restricts us from towing cars if cars were parked when they were supposed to be that Somerville has the in on. Uh, as a Somerville re resident, um, <laughs> and having been towed myself, <laughs> I know that Somerville, uh, I mean, Somerville has a $6 million uh, a year parking office. Yep. Um, so they have a big office, uh, they have contracts with tow, tow companies. Uh, in the memo, I mentioned the fact that I think towing cars during snow season was, or during a snowstorm, would be difficult. I think that's yeah. different than, than the street sweeping. Sure. Um, so I just think it, it does raise, a, it may raise some public safety issues that we need to pay attention to down the road once we see how the pilot works out. Okay. Thank you. Um, looking around, I can see Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Um, and I'm kind of glad for the notice agenda glitch. I do now have the memo that popped in, but I appreciate that presentation very much, Mr. Town Manager. Uh, my question is, I, I agree with my colleague, Mr. DeCourcy, that you know, town-wide signages would not be appropriate for a short-term pilot program. Uh, but if we were to do this to be limited to one side of the street, how exactly would we communicate and enforce that without signage? Um, so cool. Mr. Chair? Yeah, 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 yeah please. Uh, so I think during a, uh, requiring people to get a permit, uh, at that mm -hmm. point we would notify them of, okay. of the rules. Um, I mean, I suppose at some point somebody's going to have to pick odd or even, but, um, you know, right. that's a policy decision above mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, that makes sense, yeah. And uh, I, I think also uh, over time, our general ability through the town website and other forms of, uh, of communication to notify people uh, would accomplish that. Thank you. Yeah, I think I, I hadn't thought about the permits. I mean, that, I think my, my desire would be to make sure that we have a very definitive point of contact with each person who could be affected so that, you know, they might, we hope, we hope the website and the town alerts, because they are wonderful, People, everyone will see them, but everyone might not. So, you know, the permits would be good. I guess that begs the question is we would also need to communicate the requirement to have a permit. But, um, so, uh, I think that makes sense. My, my other question is, have we determined, do we have uh, an expense estimate for um, a permit program what that would cost to roll out, what the offsets would be from the fees, and if this will be revenue neutral or not. Mr. Chair, I, I'll take a first crack at that, and, and then I know you and I have had some discussions about the fee issue. Uh, so we still need to do a, a cost analysis of, uh, uh, and I mean, frankly, we have not come to a final decision about who administers this, or oh, yeah. I, I made a suggestion, but that's just a suggestion. Um, I think there's also uh, some policy discussions or considerations people will have to make about whether a fee would simply recoup whatever nominal cost there would be or whether since we could charge a higher fee because we're essentially uh, not just offering a service but 
offering an amenity or benefit to people. Um, and I know just from some of my discussions with the chair that there's been some conversations about what the appropriate level has been. And so I would say before making a final determination about what the cost might be, I think there's a policy question about whether we want to charge a high fee or, or just a nominal fee. Uh, and then take it from, that's how I've thought about it, at least so far. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. Town Manager, for your report. Um, I think I just have two points on this. The first point regarding um, administratively. Um, I see that more coming out of the treasurer's office uh, since the treasurer, I believe still, part of the salary is also a parking clerk, and that's why we transferred uh, the overnight parking that the select board approves, as well as other parking issues through the treasurer's office. Plus, if you look at the staff between the select board and the treasurer's office, um, there's definitely more hands on deck um, in the treasurer's office. So I just would put that out there. I know we're not making that decision here tonight, um, but I think for continuity's sake, um, all things parking should flow through the treasurer's office unless um, this board or any other governing body appropriate seats differently. And then in, I agree in terms of signage and not wanting to uh, exacerbate CPW and having this to hire on um, additional people, uh, but I do know, I don't know if it's, I think it's Watertown, and I can't think of the, but there are two other towns, it might have been Newton, that when I've driven through, uh, just as a point of consideration, uh, I, I would want to see blanket signage all throughout the town, but either for a pilot program or if this is something that after a pilot program is adopted, I guess I would just say perhaps the five to seven gateways or uh, gateways into Arlington, uh, which would also include uh, two on Mass Ave, uh, one in the center, one closer to the Heights, one up by when you come off through two on Park Ave, when you come into Arlington from Cambridge. Um, there's designated areas that, you know, uh, whether it's a pilot program or if it's a permanent program, I know I've seen it in Waltham or Watertown where it says just a gateway entrances to, the, to that city that overnight parking is allowed. And I think they list each year odd or even size. And then the third point that I'd, I'd just like to point out, I think um, during snow emergencies, the town does have the authority to tow. I know we did do it years ago because um, I remember being called out to ride with some of the DPW trucks to kind of help with the smoother transition. And so I would say uh, not for the pilot because it's being discussed for spring to fall, but if it was something that we did adopt, um, I think we can so. We just need to establish that relationship uh, with that particular towing company because we can't afford to. I, I think at our next meeting we'll, we'll get the results of the long-range planning uh, committee's discussions that Mr. DeCourcy chairs, and uh, I know the town manager has, um, along with his staff, provided a lot of uh, financial updates and things like that. So um, I'm not looking to, to, to hire anything extra, but I don't think there's, if there was something legally that we need to do so we could tow, we should, but I don't think we have to. I think we have the ability to do it. Uh, I'm not saying we should, but if we do go to a permanent program, then that's something that I think, uh, and I can be corrected, we can do. We don't have to put anything in place in terms of a warrant article or anything else, unless I'm mistaken, and we'll have to make arrangements for that. And my, and my thing would be, I wouldn't want to be towing because, you know, that's all the time. But uh, I would just put forth, not to be decided tonight, that if, if people agreed with that, that that would only be in effect during snow emergencies, which um, is really when we want to go curb to curb, and it's usually because we have to 
or we have a major storm event coming in and we really need to for safety's sake and safety to the schools and things like that. So I'm not saying, you know, we should tow all the time, but um, for future discussions, if this is a permanent program, I would like to have the discussion of during snow emergencies, which could be zero or it could be a declared snow emergency by the town manager. It could be zero times a year. Um, I think one year we had up to four uh, declared snow emergencies, you know, for extended days. So that's it. I just wanted to put that out there for, since we're discussing things, but we're not making any concrete decisions tonight. And if I'm incorrect on the ability for the town to tow, please anyone correct me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Mahan. You know, so, um, Ms. Meyer? No, I'm all set. No, okay, no problem. So, <laughs> so when, when it's not on the big screen, yeah, when the, so now I have it on, um, well, never mind. I was about to explain the technical issue. But, anyways, uh, so, so here's my thinking. Uh, I mean, the goal is just to communicate with everyone a lot. I mean, and so you have uh, this report back from the town manager. I, I very much appreciate him reaching out to all of the members of his staff because at some point it just made more sense to me for the, the town manager to enter face with his staff and for the, uh, Mr. Corsi and I to try and set up meetings you know, um, with them because the, if there was necessity for a follow-up, then, then the town manager would be in a position to do the follow-ups much more quickly than, than we could. Uh, and so I very much appreciate this. Uh, I would like for us the, at our next meeting you know, to uh, keep this, the conversation going and start answering some questions I mean, about whether or not we want to do this town-wide or not, I mean, the, the time frame, and, uh, and also um, start working on um, thoughts about be the policy behind the fee. I mean, what are we trying to get at with a fee or not having a fee? Um, that's, that's the first binary aspect of it. And the next one, if we decide yes, then what that should be and what are, are our goals mean uh, uh, based on uh, that level of fee you know, or intentions. So. Uh, I'm going to put it on the agenda for the next meeting, it, uh, and uh, I mean, I think we are on, all on consensus with respect to um, signage being the same side, one side of the street. Uh, I did have a question for uh, the town manager. I mean, right now, um, I mean, what happens with people who don't move when it snows? I mean, there's just no emergency. I, mean, I shouldn't say what happens. I mean, is is what is the level of problem with people who don't move? Uh, and I think it's probably on that first snow, right? And, uh... Well, uh, in, in general, uh, Mr. Chair, we work very hard with those people to get them into town or school lots uh, and get them off the street. Um, and so they, they do know uh, those people who have the limited overnight parking permits, um, we are basically pretty active with them in terms of moving them off the street and in general we have pretty good luck with getting those people because uh, it's you know a relatively small enough number to be able to park at, at um, either our municipal lots or our various school lots. Gotcha and what about the people who aren't parking uh, who are parking overnight without permits? I mean essentially my question is I mean what amount of what kind of problem do we have with people parking on the streets during a snow emergency? And um, I'm, I'm not aware that it's currently a big problem because, as I say, we know the people who have those permits and are yeah. able to work with them. Right. Um, if people are generally parking overnight and without authority, they get ticketed. Uh, the yeah. police do enforce that, and the police would enforce that going forward. Um, but in my discussions with uh, DPW and police, they did not bring that up as an issue. Uh, and they, they did mention uh, efforts that we do take to get those people right. into those lots. Right. You know, if it's not, if it's just not, I mean, we don't have any people that we have to get off the streets during snow um, by towing or whatever, you know, then it's fine. It's good. It's good to stash both. Um, it's not an issue um, in that respect. I mean, so. Okay, and, um, and so the other thing uh, is that and, uh, Mr. Corsi and I would also like to hold uh, another forum uh, uh, with residents. I mean, uh, and so I'm hoping that at our next meeting, we can maybe iron out some of our intentions, I mean, uh, then kind of 
bring that before um, residents. I mean, if we haven't ironed it all out, that's fine. You know, uh, maybe they can help us iron it out. Uh, but in, in for the sake of just the having people be as aware as we can make them, you know, have another forum, um, get some more input, being in, and then, uh, so that would be early February, and so then uh, either, um, I guess we'll have first meeting is the 6th or something, and then we have three weeks off before next month. So then the last week of February, I think we want to make a decision being as to whether we're going to go forward with the um, pilot or not, being so that we can aim for starting uh, in May 1st, you know, and running it six months uh, uh, through November, perhaps. Uh, and if and if we fail that target, you know, then I think we could make the, the June 1st target. I mean, so let's try and make a decision by um, in the February. And so um, that's my thinking. Uh, I, I, if you have any comments or suggestions, feedback of any kind, I'm all ears. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, there's no need for a vote now. Just a update discussion. I mean, uh, so all right. So let me. I should memorize the agenda. Okay. Yeah, I'm pulling up here. Okay. Uh, so I guess we're at our second open forum. You know. Uh, so do we have anyone that wants to? Um, Say anything? All right. No okay, great. And so um, next was correspondence received. I mean, we have a recommendation for um, tree maintenance by James Plumbing. Turn to my colleagues. Move received. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Motion um, received by Mr. Hurd. Second. Uh, second by Ms. Helmuth. Yeah. Questions, comments? Okay. okay. And so on uh, a motion to receive by Mr. Um, Hurd and a second by Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mr. Hein. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCorsi? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Yes. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Deans? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, so we now on to um, uh, new business. Hey, uh, Ms. Meyer? No new business, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hunt? No new business, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Poy? I'd just like to make an announcement of two policies that I uh, recently put out. Uh, one is on uh, banning of the use of rodenticides by town departments. This is consistent with uh, uh, policies as voted by town meeting last year. Uh, so I, um, I, that will be posted on the town website um, later this week. Uh, the second policy I put out was uh, a memo uh, which I copied the select board on, but was to uh, the, the uh, Conservation Commission and the Park and Rec Commission saying as uh, to artificial turf fields, it is not my intention. In fact, I will not put forward for funding, permitting, or... Um, or construction any uh, new artificial turf fields in town to allow uh, a period of further study of these fields. There's been questions that have been raised all along about um, the materials used in these fields, um, and I think it is necessary for there to be further study of those issues, um, and uh, so that will be in effect through the remainder of my term into July. Um, those are the two policies I put out and wanted to inform the board and the public about. Thank you, Mr. Pooler. Mr. Corsi? Uh, no new business, thank you. Mr. Hurd? Yeah, I just wanted, as we sit here in our meeting, bring up that I think we, whether we have it on our agenda item or just do it, we seem to be the only municipality left in the world that doesn't allow the public to come into our meetings. I think everyone else does. Um, I don't really see the need for it. Um, these meetings work better when we're face to face. It's nice to have members in here with us. It's nice to have people right in front of us. I would encourage people when they're able to do it to come in. That's when our meetings were a lot more enjoyable. 
um, and a lot more efficient. We certainly saw some technical issues today and glitches that we see with the hybrid format, which I, I know we're going to continue to investigate and improve and use in certain situations, but I would like to see the discussion and if not the outright allowing the public to come back in because I think there's some members of the public that are they used to come to our meetings that might not be as comfortable with the Zoom format that don't come or aren't heard because of it. And again, I think I'm not aware of any other municipality that doesn't allow the public to come to the meeting. So I would like to see it, whether it's on an agenda item or further discussion about that so we can, you know, get back to life. Thanks, Mr. Heard. Um, Ms. Allen. No new business. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Mahan. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Very briefly, I just want to say that uh, I requested, received, and returned to the town clerk my re-election papers for the select board, and she informs me my signatures are certified, so um, I definitely will be a candidate for re-election. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Mahan. And yes, I'll be joining uh, Ms. Mahan in, in the race to do this for another three years because, well, sometimes I'm just a glutton. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and yeah, uh, so, and, and, and I'm genuinely excited about the, the notion of, um, of um, engaging residents again in, in, and explaining to them why it is that uh, I would like to um, continue to be on the select board. Uh, and um, my other piece of new business is that um, uh, the Civic Engagement Group is going to be hosting a forum with the uh, Metropolitan Area Planning Council on uh, the 26th of January. It's going to be all remote, uh, and, and I'll get that posted in, on the website. That's breaking news for here now. And, 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 um, and kind of backing up to uh, some of the town manager said about the uh, decides me, I think there is a a plan for there to be a forum, um, educational forum in, for the public regarding the uses of adventicides that's going to um, be uh, probably hosted by the Board of Health, maybe with some collaboration um, with the civic engagement group. So um, with that, you know, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Nina said. Mr. Chairman, may I? Uh, yes. I believe we have two items on the executive session. For oh, the right, right. I'm, I'm just completely forgetting about that. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes, we need to go to um, executive session. So, um, Ms. Mahan? Um, can you hear me? I don't know if yes. I unmuted myself. Okay. I was going to say, we have executive session, so I'd like to move that the board enter into executive session in accordance with uh, Mass General Law 5960 and 214, as well as um, in accordance with any general or special law or federal grant and aid requirements, um, uh, including but not limited to the approval and or release of executive session minutes and that our regularly scheduled select board meeting will adjourn concurrent with the adjournment of our executive session meeting. Thank you. And can I get a second? Uh, so on a motion to go into executive session by Ms. Mahan and a second by Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Hein? Yes. Mr. Helmet. Yes. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Chairman's vote. We're in executive session. Thank you. Thank you.